Hello, my name is Val Berkovici. I'm the Cloud and Big Data Czar at NetApp. It is my distinct pleasure today to present to you at the Virtual Data Fabric event. And we're going to talk today about a particular use case of the Data Fabric. You're going to be getting lots of information about the Data Fabric itself. But the Lean Cloud use case of the Data Fabric has become a very, very popular way to really explain the value. And of course, you see my Twitter handle there at the bottom of this slide. If you're interested in live tweeting this virtual session, so to speak, please feel free to also tag me at valbu, which is spelled V-A-L-B-0-0. First thing we're going to do is have a controversial brief discussion about the definition of cloud. And the joke in the industry is, of course, there's as many opinions about cloud as there are people in IT. But the reality is that cloud is fundamentally, first and foremost, about making money specifically new incremental business value. And I speak today, actually, the day after we had Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, all three of which announced fantastic revenue on the back of cloud earnings and cloud revenue to Wall Street yesterday. So clearly, it's a very topical subject as we end October in the year 2015. What I'm going to refer to in this particular slide is something that's a bit more detailed and systematic. It's an analysis and a report, as a matter of fact, that's published monthly, updated monthly, by a venture capital firm called Bessemer Venture Partners. And they published something you can easily Google called the Cloud Index. This index is comprised of brand new companies that are cloud native, born in the cloud application, so to speak. And it documents the public accounting, meaning either the IPO value or the merger and acquisition M&A value, business valuation of companies and applications, services that were born in the cloud. They started measuring this about three and a half, four years ago, around 2012. And year to date, up until now, multiple years to date, up until now, we see that the actual business value, the net new business value created by the cloud, is already up to 178 billion US dollars. And what's interesting to note are the companies that are not yet in the index because they're not public yet. So Uber, rumored to be valued at about $50 billion, is not yet on this list. Airbnb, rumored to be valued at about $40 billion, are not yet on this list. And of course, companies like Facebook don't even qualify for the category, and yet many of them consider Facebook a cloud service. So my personal estimate is the reason we're all talking about cloud is there's been about $400 billion a new business value created by the cloud, measured new business value. And that's why it continues to be, after all these years, such a hot buzzword that won't go away. Now, of course, for every bit of revenue, there's also a cost. And there's a second report that's really important to follow here as we explain the value of NetApp's data fabric. This is by an analyst firm called the 451. They publish a report called the Cloud Price Index, as opposed to the Cloud Index from Bessemer Venture Partners. And the 451's Cloud Price Index highlights some very key information. The two bars, or the two lines you see actually, progressing along this chart, uh, the bottom one, the dotted blue line, is a collection of the small number, typically 3 to 5% of all cloud services offered by the major cloud providers. About 3 to 5% of them are discounted heavily on a regular basis. And that's what the cloud index, cloud price index, excuse me, tracks. The cloud price index tracks the actual discount of various cloud services over time. The bottom, again, dotted line index shows that there's a fairly aggressive price decline on some commodity cloud compute and commodity cloud storage services. But notably, they are the vast minority of all the higher level development and analytic and valuable cloud services that the service providers themselves provide. The other 95 to 97% of services are represented by the solid orange line at the top. And you notice a stark difference in price reductions over time, meaning the vast majority of cloud services that customers pay for are not heavily discounted over time. And therefore, particularly if you analyze the financial results of Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure Cloud, and Google's Cloud, you'll notice that they run very, very high profit margins. High gross profit margins that are typically larger than a 60-odd percent IT vendor gross margins, and even higher operating margins than, than systems vendors that sell both hardware and software. So clearly, cloud is a very profitable business. Uh, and unless you're very, very careful, 
cloud is not a very cheap alternative to traditional IT. So where are enterprises spending money on technology? That is a question that Gartner asks very often, and it's a much smarter question than what your IT budget is. What I'm showing you here on this slide is the result of a global survey of the Global 2000. And again, the question is, where are you spending money on technology to improve business as opposed to what your IT budget is? And the three categories that emerge are first a 14% category as a global average, meaning particularly in the United States, some of those numbers like 14 and 20% might be higher. But outside of the United States, whether it's Europe or Asia, China, India, and so forth, those numbers might actually be lower. The global average is 14% on an initiative called Business Transformation. And that is where all sorts of brick and mortar enterprises invest in new digital services to fundamentally digitize their companies to prevent from being Amazon if you're a bookseller, to prevent from being Netflix if you happen to be in the video business, to prevent from being Ubered or prevent from being Airbnb. Effectively, either digitize as a defensive maneuver to, do, to protect a significant install base and market share you might have, or more aggressively, digitize to capture new markets entirely or to capture market share from slower competitors that don't digitize their businesses. That's the 14% of business transformation budgets that we see right now. Following that is about a 20% category of technology spend, and that's comprised of two different kinds of, of investments. One is, of the various business transformation efforts that succeed, because typically you employ a fast-fail, an MBA-style fast-fail approach to experiment with business transformation. Not every experiment succeeds, but a few do. Of the ones that are successful and you want to deploy them at scale, you invest some of that 20% in actually deploying those experiments that are successful at scale to recognize even more revenue and, and more market share from the various new product or service. Another example of that 20% would be virtual desktops where a lot of companies now want to take their knowledge workers, which had a lot of power on desktops and laptops, but make them much more mobile and closer to their customers via tablet and smartphone technologies. So VDI is another great example of what goes into that 20% category. And finally, the traditional IT budget is actually that 66%. What's left over is typically keeping the lights on or maintenance mode of legacy applications. And the IT budget pressures on the 66% continue to be very severe. A lot of IT departments, you know, surprise if you're, if you're working for one of them or service one of them, continuously have to do more with less today. But it's a very different conversation for business transformation initiatives, and it's a very different conversation for growth of business transformation initiatives or growth of new applications for IT. The other thing that gives us confidence about this data is it's not a brand new survey. It's six years in running. As we near the end of 2014, uh, 2015, uh, Gartner will update the survey and have seven years of data. And we've seen a lot of consistency going back to 2008 in these three categories. The numbers might go up and down a few percent, but at the end of the day, these are the three dominant categories. And in proportion, you see business transformation being strategic with no limitations really encumbered. Uh, you see tr growth following that. And finally, uh, the, the remaining portion of that 66% global average is the IT budget. So let's take a look at life cycles now. Life cycles are very important. And what I've done with this slide is simply map those three categories into a life cycle visual that we're going to use for the rest of this presentation. After project life cycles, we're going to drill down specifically into application and application module life cycles. If you've heard of Docker and containers, which are a very hot buzzword in our technology industry today, you'll notice that we can divide a lot of these life cycles into microservices which is another common name for container-based applications or container-based application modules. And the three dominant categories of those life cycles are the dev and test life cycle, followed by a deployment and scale life cycle. And finally, at the end of that life cycle, you have a maintenance mode for typically legacy operations. And it's worth noting that you can have a very tight loop here for agile development processes, but you can also have a more waterfall, elaborate style loop you know, if you're doing a waterfall methodology which takes a bit longer and you have much more distinct phases between these stages. Here's a, a final bit of information I will share with you before we dig into the data fabric itself. And it's a very revealing survey, very current. This is IDC measuring what happened in 2014 with enterprise cloud spending. 
And the good news is for cloud, cloud service providers, is that enterprises spent a fortune in the cloud, particularly with public clouds in 2014. But what enterprises also realized is there's enormous innovation value in public clouds. The development tools, the development services are extremely rich, extremely empowering, letting you experiment quickly, letting you again fail quickly with things that don't work, and letting you deploy, even as prototypes with very little code, extremely rich mobile applications, tablet applications, uh, Internet of Things, IoT applications with geolocation and so forth. A lot of development and innovation is really enabled by public cloud. But after the development phase is eliminated, as I showed you in the previous slide, after we pass through the development and testing phase, we basically see that the ma majority already, we're already uh, after the first year at 51.6% of all enterprises surveyed, the majority of enterprises repatriate data and workloads back to other service providers or other clouds. And that's because of the reality of the cloud landscape. If we look at the three categories again from a cloud category perspective, we have the hyperscale public clouds at the top, we have service providers or managed service providers over on the bottom right-hand side. And following the life cycle, we have hosting providers or your on-premises data center as the third category. And where innovation happens today, in fact, I like to say to be a little bit controversial, if you're in charge of a business transformation initiative at your company and you're not using one of the public cloud vendors and some of the enormous capabilities they deliver to your developers, you're actually practicing professional malpractice. You're letting one of your industry competitors beat you to innovation by actually using the public clouds where they're extremely valuable. And as we know, development and test phases really benefit from having an elastic infrastructure, meaning you can't predict how many servers you'll need to prototype a particular feature, and you certainly can't predict at scale how many servers you'll want to use for massive testing of any particular new feature or application. And the elasticity of public clouds is unbeatable for that value, that value of the life cycle, where the workloads are fundamentally unpredictable. However, any professional application developer today, any professional DevOps team, instruments their applications and their workloads at a very detailed, fine-grained level. There's a whole ecosystem of vendors with companies like New Relic and others that deliver performance metrics to make sure that those applications for the mobile users, the tablet users, the web users are very responsive and quick so that they encourage and drive more user traffic. And as you measure all that data, you understand your workloads at a much better level. And the workloads become less predictable. Therefore, the value, the economics of elasticity has lower value when your workloads go from unpredictable to very predictable. And that's when you come to realize that operating predictable workloads with efficiency, uh, with optimizations for performance, with the ability to adhere to actual international regulations around data privacy, as per the recent EU Safe Harbor ruling. And from an overall control perspective, it makes more sense to take workloads that are now predictable and move them on to customized infrastructure that's designed for a more predictable style of workloads. And this is why a thriving ecosystem now is emerging around the public hyperscale cloud providers with providers such as HP, which recently announced their Helion service will no longer compete against Amazon, but be able to take workloads that move off of Amazon that are more customized and tailored and, and more predictable. Uh, Cisco's cloud service, Rackspace, a lot of open stack based clouds are really tailor made for taking predictable workloads that don't need wild elasticity and operating them with better quality of service, better governance and control, and most importantly, at a better bottom line cost. And finally, you can continue this lifecycle trend all the way through to hosting vendors or your own, own on-premises data center. For example, well-known SaaS companies, software as a service, such as Salesforce.com, have been delivering applications in a cloud format for many, many years now, and many of their applications and application modules are themselves legacy cloud applications. And it makes a lot more sense for them to use a legacy operational model to continue to service those workloads and be able to free up money and free up developer resources and time to develop new functionality to continue to gain more and more market share. So where does a NetApp data fabric portfolio fit into all of this? What I'm showing here are actually two building blocks at the bottom. The traditional hardware devices that we've sold 
are merely building blocks in the data fabric today. And above them are a bunch of rectangles. The blue rectangles are actually rectangles that represent virtual controllers, that is, software operating systems such as cluster data on tap, storage grid web scale, AltaVault, and even the Mars OS inside FlashRay. Those are all now virtual controllers that sit on top of, optionally, our hardware building blocks or other supported third-party servers, white box servers, if you will. Meaning that enterprise architects now can configure as many of these virtual controllers as they need on qualified hardware that is not NetApp, on cloud service providers, which of course you know, have the hardware completely abstracted from the, the software itself, as well as on NetApp hardware, where we, we, we predict that you'll have the optimal price performance, the optimal reliability and availability and serviceability characteristics for predictable workloads. And these rectangles, the blue ones are NetApp sold and supported, the orange ones are open source supported rectangles, represent really useful virtual controller building blocks, Lego style, for enterprise architects, again, to deploy on-premises in the hyperscale cloud, as well as on qualified third-party service providers. And as you may know, NetApp already has a list of 275 qualified service providers that are part of the NetApp service provider partner program. And every one of those partners and more are now qualifying themselves to be data fabric ready, data fabric certified. So these virtual controllers now give us enormous power in terms of control points throughout the various cloud life cycles so that we can follow the life cycle, the natural life cycle of application and application module workloads. Which means now we give enormous innovation power to your developers to go and deliver true business transformation in the public cloud where those providers provide maximum value with their economics of elasticity. And as those workloads become instrumented, as they become much more predictable, and as you can figure out exactly what infrastructure requirements you're going to need, you no longer have to pay that compound tax for a very stable, predictable workload in an elastic public cloud that isn't priced for that kind of workload. It can certainly support it, but the price becomes, instead of something that's valuable, literally an ongoing compound tax. You don't have to pay that tax anymore in the hyperscale public clouds. You can migrate those specific workloads to other service providers that are running vCloud Air, that are running OpenStack, CloudStack, or any other kind of orchestration environment. And finally, migrate those back to hosters or your own on-premises data center. And it's the data fabric that gives you the full visibility into where your data is throughout its life cycle across all these different service providers. It gives you the freedom to choose between all these three different kinds of categories of service providers. And of course, it gives you the control and the data mobility to be able to easily use mature, widely recognized leading technologies such as Snap Mirror for data mobility between the various cloud providers or native open uh, native object storage grid web scale replication, as well as the AltaVault controller itself, which is a natural data mover designed to stream workloads with compression and deduplication built in. So freedom, control, mobility are the key values we bring with the data fabric portfolio to the modern application development lifecycle. What we're showing here is the, the back half of that development lifecycle, more of the legacy mode, and what I'll conclude with here today is the most advanced form of the data fabric. And ironically, this was the one that was available earliest, about two years ago initially. This is where you come to the realization that workload mobility is a necessary thing for a sustainable application in the cloud, a sustainable application module in the cloud. However, workload mobility, as we remember from our VMware days, is far simpler than data mobility. Because, of course, data has gravity. It's a well-known concept within enterprise IT architecture circles. And because data is hard to move, there's always more data available to move than bandwidth we can afford to move it, we end up bringing a lot of workloads to the data. And the notion of moving gigabytes of data around seems sustainable. Terabytes of data around this lifecycle seems manageable and maybe affordable. But it's becoming clear today that if we start to move applications at scale, big data applications in particular, and the calculation starts to include petabytes of data movement, 
then that movement throughout the life cycle is no longer sustainable. It's no longer affordable. And so the most advanced form of the NetApp data fabric is enabled by a product we call NetApp Private Storage, where we strategically co-locate the data adjacent to the compute data centers of the various cloud providers, be they hyperscale public clouds, tier two OpenStack style service providers, or your own on-premises data center. And we use leading co-location partners like Equinix for that. And we actually leverage very advanced features that Equinix provides called a cloud exchange, which lets you dynamically provision capacity to enable a storage connection from the compute side of a cloud data center to the storage side of your data, which is controlled and managed and owned by you in your own private cage within a co-location facility. These co-location facilities, because they are geographically close and adjacent to the major cloud data center providers, give you fantastic performance and latency be between the compute side of what you want to do in the cloud and the storage side, which you want to own. In fact, I've recently spoken to one service provider out of Germany called DARS, which services a lot of financial customers uh, out of Frankfurt, and they have dark fiber connections between their co-location facility and all the major cloud providers, and they're seeing performance as good as 400 microseconds. Put another way, that's 0 0.0.4 milliseconds of response time, which is the kind of response time you'd expect to see with the best all-flash array solutions in the marketplace today. So there's no compromise in performance here, there's full ownership of the data, and you're able to have control and governance and auditing enabled on your data, but you're able to use the cloud for what it's best at, which is renting the compute while you own that data. And fundamentally, what this lets you do is accomplish what every business leader wants to do today in a global enterprise, which is to innovate like a startup with the imagination, the creativity, the pace, and certainly a lot of the excite exciting user adoption amongst leading cloud users of data. So innovate like a startup, but as a large global enterprise business, deploy like an enterprise with mature security policies, mature data availability policies through backup, recovery, and archive, and very, very sophisticated control and very, very high levels of performance, extremely low latency, which means you can position your data globally closest to where your users are. So this is the end of the introduction to the Lean Cloud use case for the data fabric. I hope it's become useful to you. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me to your Data Fabric virtual event. This is Val Berkovici, signing off.